um, thank you all for being here. This is really exciting to look out and see this big crowd and see lots of familiar faces, uh, colleagues, friends, and even some family um, who may have to come for other reasons. Um, the Great War, as World War I was called at the time, was a major global conflict that occurred primarily because of the breakdown of old alliances and European powers. With the allied countries of France, Russia, Great Britain, and Italy lined up against central powers of Austro-Hungary, Germany, and the Ottoman Empire. The U.S. was neutral until about 1970 when it joined the allied forces. There are so many images of World War I. Trenches, machine guns, barbed wire, shell holes, chemical weapons. The social, financial, and psychological impact of the war was huge, to say the least. Nine million people, let me say that again, nine million people are thought to have been killed die, or died during the war, which was a very bloody conflict with millions of individuals suffering fatal or disabling wounds and injuries. The great influenza pande pandemic of 1918-1919 coincided with the war that only worsened the ugly impact. So, with so much illness, injury and death. We'll take a look today at the myths and realities of nursing during World War I as some of the key workers on the front line helping, to, helping soldiers and others who were injured or ill during the war. So we're going to focus on that this afternoon. Let me start with this quote. This is from a diary from my grandmother, Jenny Anger Berman. She wrote a very brief diary while she was um, in France during the war. And this quote, I think, sums up a lot about the realities of World War I nursing. She writes, the next day we were put on duty in the Pontonens and barracks within the walls Napoleon built. I was put in a pneumonia and flu ward. Honestly, I never saw so many very sick men in my life. It actually made tears come to one's eyes to see them delirious and dying. But I had to brace up and do my best. Many of them were in just a few days before they passed away. A nurse in the ward we left was a flu victim too. Even though she was not of our unit, we felt so badly. And again, I think her quote nicely summarizes the um, myths and realities that we'll be talking about here. As I said, for this talk, I want to focus on the myths and reality of World War I nursing. I'll talk briefly about those myths, although I won't spend a huge amount of time on that. Um, in order to understand those myths, however, I really want to step back and look at the socio-political context of the time because I think that's important. I think I'm shutting, sh am I going in and out on the mics? Should I do anything different? Little, is it kind of flopping to the side there? Should I put it? See if that, I, tell me if it's shorting out, but I, that's what it sounded like before. Like I said, I'm going to focus on the myths and reality, but I kind of want to step back a little bit and talk about the socio-political and professional context of that time, because I think it's important to understand nursing in that light. We'll spend just a little bit of time talking about World War I and the military health care that was provided during that war, how it was organized and delivered. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about nurses' experiences in the Great War. I'll be using a lot of information from letters and diaries that sort of really bring to light what was happening during the war. We'll talk briefly about what happened after the war in terms of individual nurses, but nursing collectively. Still seems like I'm cutting in and out. Go ahead. Um, and then we'll, I'll sort of weave through some issues around gender and nursing. And then hopefully I'll have some time for some questions because I really want to hear from all of you um, about this particular topic. So let's talk about the myths of the great world, of the world war, of nursing in particular, but the World War I specifically. There's always been a lot of myths about nursing, and I see a lot of my nursing colleagues out in the audience, and so they'll smile when I say this. There's the wonderful image of Sari Gamp from the Charles Dickens novels of the sort of drunk, slovenly um, nurse who sort of stumbles in and that sort of thing. That's sort of one set of myths about nursing. There's the other set of delightful myths in which nurses are really these sort of overly sexed women who are out 
out looking for rich doctors to marry them and stuff like that. Of course, the reality is somewhere in between. In relation to World War I, there are several really interesting myths, and I want to talk briefly about those. Um, one of the first myths is about this courageous volunteer nurse. A volunteer nurse was what we would call at the time an untrained nurse. This was a, a woman in this particular case who volunteered to participate in World War I, did not have a background in nursing, went through sort of an on-the-job type of training. They were really commonly used in Britain during World War I, and they've become really sort of a part of the World War I lore. Those of you who watch Downton Abbey, for example, remember Sybil? Um, she became a volunteer nurse, in essence, during World War I. Well, there's a lot of myths about these volunteer nurses. They tend to actually come from fairly wealthy backgrounds, well-to-do women. Uh, this, you can imagine the conflict then with trained nurses who came from probably more middle class, even a little bit lower class families, this sort of conflict between the two. And that sort of got blown up in World War I, so to speak. There was a lot about this in the literature, about the put upon volunteer nurse who had volunteered to come and had no training but was there to help everybody and was going to do great things. And then there was this bullying nurse who came along who was the trained nurse who put upon all this stuff upon these trained, these volunteer nurses. Well, the truth is much more in between. Actually, the record is pretty good that these nurses, volunteer and trained nurses, got along fairly well during the war. But you will see this a lot. Again, this is, a, this is one of those real myths of World War I, that these volunteer nurses were these really put upon courageous nurses. There's another image from World War I about nurses. It's what we call the romantic nurse. Those of you who've read Farewell to Arms by Hemingway will remember Oh, what's her first name? Barclay, I think, is her last name. She's the love in the book, and she's a nurse. And um, if you think about um, uh, Dr. Shivago, uh, Larissa is another one of those nurses in the literature. They're these wonderful sort of pure women, um, although they're kind of driven by passion, so it's this kind of a complex character. So there's this whole myth about this romantic nurse, again, pure in heart, but over there, again, finding all kinds of interesting ways to show their passion to people. The final one is the nurse's heroine. There's actually a fair amount of truth to this particular myth. Um, we'll talk about what nurses did, and you'll probably come away thinking they were, in a lot of ways, heroine. Um, but this even got played up more. And you'll see it in this sort of this recruiting poster that I put up here. This is a wonderful one. You've got this the nurse as angel, and then she's sort of a Madonna figure holding this wounded soldier. It's kind of over the top, if you think about it. This is not really what nurses looked like or did. But this was a way um, to really talk about nurses just going over the top in many ways. Um, so these three myths are, in, when you look at the historical and literary record from World War I, these are three really common myths. But they're not really the reality of World War I. This is a long quote, but I really think it's a good one, and so I put the whole thing in. I think this really talks about the reality of World War I nursing. And I'll read it. Above all, nurses saw themselves as fighting against pain, disease, and death. Theirs was the second battlefield where the wounded were drawn back from the abyss of death. And by inhabiting that battlefield, nurses themselves faced hardship, injury, and sometimes death. Beyond this, nurses were fighting for recognition, for the right to exercise the freedoms and responsibilities that were due them as both citizens and as professionals. For some, this was a fight for women's right, and above all, the right to vote. For others, it was a struggle for the recognition of their skills and talents as not being merely innate elements of their femininity, but qualities that had been um, hard won through years of training and discipline. The serene image of the nurse by the bedside of the wounded soldier belies the turbulence that infused the everyday existence of the veiled warrior. And that's the phrase that Christine Hallett who's a scholar of World War I, uses in order to talk about nurses. And I think this gets at much more of the reality of nurse, World War I nursing. But let's step back a little bit. I think it's important to look at the socio-political and professional context of that time in which nurses were coming about. This is really the origins of modern nursing during this time. Also things like modern medicine, but we'll focus specifically on nursing. 
So this is the progressive era, about 1890 to about 1920. And if you think back what we learned about that in our history classes, this is a time of major societal changes, this whole industrialization, massive immigration, particularly from Europe, all kinds of urbanization, people leaving the rural areas, moving into big cities in order to find work. It's also a time of an interesting thought about the nature of the world. Um, when you think about progressivism, it was this idea that we could make society better by harnessing the government and using enlightened use of regulations, incentives, and punishment. So it was a time of increasing government involvement as well. Now, there's some real benefits of progressivism, if you think about it at that time. This is a time when women's rights are becoming very much a focus, workers' rights. It's also a bit of a dark time, because it's certainly a time we were thinking about things like, well, we should make the race pure, um, and things like that that came out in, in not particularly good ways. Um, this is a time of a lot of poverty. Um, so there's a dark side to progressivism, but it's certainly the context in which nursing and other health professions were beginning to develop. So let's talk about health care. Um, this is a really interesting time for health care. Paul Starr um, wrote probably one of the most um, famous books about sort of the historical, cultural, social aspects of medicine, the development of medicine. And I think his quote really highlights what's happening at that time. There were profound changes in Americans' way of life and forms of conscience that made them more dependent upon professional authority and more willing to accept it as legitimate. In pre-industrial America, rural and small town communities endowed their members with a wide range of skills and self-confidence in dealing with their own um, needs. But towards the end of the 19th century, as their society became more urban, Americans became more accustomed to relying on the specialized skills of strangers. So instead of taking care of our own issues within our own family or small community, we're now beginning to think about, oh, well, that doctor that lives in that city over there or that hospital might actually be a part of my care as an individual. And that's very new in our country around this time. So you see a significant growth of hospitals. This picture over here on this side, whoops, is actually a picture. This is my grandmother here. I've used liberally a number of pictures from my grandmother's album. This is her. This is her sister. Um, and it says at the bottom of it something about the Benjamin, Benjamin Shirtliff Hospital, which I looked up is in a hospital that was around for a bit of time in California, probably in a home of some sort, not a big hospital like we think about now. But again, it sort of highlights this growth of hospitals. And Rosenberg also wrote a very um, prominent history of hospitals. And he, this quote is from him. In 1800, the hospital was still an insignificant aspect of American medical care. No gentleman of property or standing would have found himself in a hospital unless stricken with insanity or felled by epidemic or accident in a strange city. When respectable persons or members of their family fell ill, they would be treated at home, of course. Much of this had changed by the first decade of the 20th century. The hospital had become far more central, both in provision of medical care and in the careers of ambitious physicians as well. So you see this growth of, of institutions that we'd not had prior to this. And this is happening again just prior to World War I. Lots is happening in the profession of medicine during this time period. Lots of competition. If you read Paul Starr's book, there's this sort of competition between different types of medicine at that time, with allopathic medicine rising over those, like the homeopaths that were quite popular at that time period. This is when you see specialization just beginning. Prior to that, everybody took care of everything as a physician. Now you start to see physicians who are taking care of just your skin or just your heart or something like that. It's the start of regulation for physicians as well. Increase in diagnostic abilities. You see x-rays now available, for example. Prior to that, there would not have been much ability to look at that. Physicians are now beginning to affiliate very purposely with hospitals. That was not the case before this time, but they're beginning to do that. And they're also moving towards office-based care. Prior to that, if you'd had a physician, they would have come to your home. Now, this quote really highlights that. Since the mountain cannot come to Mohammed, he must come to the mountain. That is, the patient must come to see the physician in his office. So you see this real change that now care is occurring again within institutions. So what's happening in nursing then right before World War I? 
And it, back to the stereotype, there was a very prominent stereotype of that time in which the nurse had every degree of unfitness and immorality and they, that was, had been employed for the care of sick and that focuses on the unfitness and immorality. So out of this comes Florence Nightingale. All of you know Florence Night Nightingale's name. She was very bothered by this sort of stereotype because again, as with all stereotypes, there was truth to some of this as well. So she really began the modern training school movement for nursing in England. She was very clear in her mind that she wanted refined women, and you get the sense of refined when you look at this quote from a textbook over here of 1907. This is what, whoops, this is what, well, I can't find it. This is what should have a uh, nurse have if she was going to become a nurse, these kind of great characters. This is what a refined woman would have looked like. She would have had neatness, economy, courtesy, obedience, promptness, self-control, sympathy, tact, truthfulness, dignity, respect for physicians and officers, and I like this, respect for secrets. I'm not quite sure what those secrets might have been, but we would have had to respect them. So she's really focused on making sure that we brought these respectable women into nursing. But she's also clear about one other piece of this. She very much said that technical instruction was also required. There was a lot of thinking at that time that any woman could be a nurse. That's just innate womenness to be able to take care of patients. And she said, no, no, no. You need good women to come into nursing, but you need all of this training in order for them to be really good nurses. So she combined both of these. The first training school in the United States started in 1873 following uh, Front Nightingale's model. It wasn't quite the same. There are some interesting differences, but that's another talk. So by the, just be prior to World War I, we're beginning to see educational programs becoming a bit longer in the United States. They're now the good ones. The ones that are well talked about are about three years in length. Mostly apprenticeship. So these are ones in which a student comes in and works on the job. It's on the job training. There were a few, few lectures, but not very many. Most of that time was spent in a hospital, but a student might have had some experience when they went out and did what we call private duty, taking care of a patient in their home. Interestingly enough, hospitals, and this is a piece that's hard for us to imagine it now at this time, but hospitals were actually staffed by student nurses. They were not staffed by grad, what we call graduate nurses. Student nurses provided the care. There were a few graduate nurses who were in the hospital to oversee these nurses. They may have been the head nurse or nurse administrator on a unit, and she's working with them in terms of their education. But virtually all your care would have been provided by a student nurse, um, which is really interesting to think about. Um, nursing practice at that time was hard. They worked a lot, often seven days a week, 60 or 70 hours a week. Most graduates, like I said, did not work in hospitals. They actually worked in private duty in people's homes or in public health. Um, so it's hard for us to think back. This is a very different time in nursing. And there's a lot happening in terms of whether that's the right thing. Should we have these students basically be low paid employees working in a hospital providing the care? I put this in here. This is actually my, my grandmother's um, registration in 1916, if I remember correctly. States were beginning to require registration for nurses. She was one of the first. She was number, I can't quite remember, but like number 120 or something in Washington to be registered as a registered nurse in the state of Washington. Um, so this is just beginning this process of registration across the country. Now, this, all of this development of nursing is not without controversy. I included this quote because I just simply love it. Experience proves that it is not possible to give any useful instruction to nurses in anatomy and physiology. <laughs> uh, just useless. And that it is unwise as it is impractical to teach them anything concerning the cause and effects of disease. Nor is it necessary to do this to make them good nurses. And this goes back to the... <laughs> Jeannie's got her mouth wide open. <laughs> Yeah, the nurses in the room are appalled by this. But this was the sentiment at the time by a lot of people. This is by the hospital uh, medical board in uh, New York. But this was a very common sentiment by physicians and others that just any nurse could become a woman, could be any, nurse, any woman could become a nurse, and you would just put them with patient care, and it would be se second nature for them to take care of this person, this ill person. 
the idea that, and I'll use the word she because they were mostly she at that time, the idea that you would need to educate that woman in any way did not make sense to people. It's just second nature to walk in and care for people as women. Um, so there was lots of controversy about this idea that we should educate nurses. Now, it was a bit controversial in nursing as well. Um, I think women, gender and nursing is a common theme that runs throughout um, this particular talk, but throughout our history. This is a time, right again, right before World War I, of the struggle for vote on the part of women. Not all nurses um, were advocates of the right for women to vote. Um, there was a struggle for nurses for recognition. Um, so like I said, there were just beginning to do registration of nurses. I put this first one here. There was this whole big controversy about whether you should have separate residences for nurses. Prior to this time, nurses just lived right there in the hospital with patients. And this was controversial that you would think about moving nurses to their own place and they would have their own place to live. They, you just lived with your patients. Um, so controversy about that. Um, controversy about the increased length of nursing programs. We shouldn't be training them again. They don't need training, so why on earth would you have to have three years um, to do it? And lots of controversy about what now seems to us in ret retrospect to be not a particularly big issue, controversially about elimination of the student nurses' pay. They were actually low, very low, low-paid employees of the hospital, and the idea that we would let them truly be students was controversial, and taking away that pay was a key, 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 key piece of that argument. And women were not, and nurses were not united on these issues. So that's just what nursing and healthcare looking like just as World War I is dawning. So let's talk a little bit about World War I and military healthcare. What did that look like? This is a picture, it's a complex one, but it's a picture of the base hospital where my uh, grandmother and great aunt ended up in France. These were big facilities. This one, the, the base that they were a part of, became a, a part of a big hospital complex where there were about nine or ten base hospitals. We'll talk about that in a minute. So part of these are wards where patients would be, and they're different types. There might be a flu and pneumonia ward, a fracture ward. Part of this then is nursing quarters. Part of this is offices. So these are huge, big compounds. They're not big buildings. They're just these compounds with multiple, multiple buildings. And this is what not all of the hospitals in France looked like during the war, but what uh, this one looked like. So as you know, one of the big issues with World War I is that we were really pretty unprepared for it in a lot of ways, despite the fact that it had started in 1914 and we didn't join as a country until 1917. I think this quote from Williams Jennings Bryan in 1915 sort of sh um, sums it up. He showed his disdain for the concept of military preparedness by maintaining that, should it be necessary, a million men would spring to arms in a day. Um, now that might be true, maybe a million men would, but there'd be this whole part of training and so forth that hadn't been accounted for in this idea. So in general, we entered World War I not as prepared as we should be. In case of the medical department, the Army Medical Department, we probably were in much better shape than we had been in previous wars. Um, if you think back to the history of the Civil War, one of the huge criticisms of that time period was just how poor the medical care was during the Civil War. So we'd come quite a ways, but we were still underprepared for a war of this magnitude with these kinds of injury, injuries and illness. So how was medical care organized? Um, in 1916, um, long before we entered the war, uh, the United States began the process of developing what were called base hospitals, well-established civilian university hospitals, um, created what were called base hospitals. This over here on the corner, this is Base Hospital 50 from the University of Washington, where my grandmother was affili affiliated. So these big hospitals would form these base hospitals ready to be deployed to Europe, if they were called. This idea came from Dr. Krill, who was a surgeon in Ohio, actually was instrumental in um, helping set up what is now the Cleveland Clinic. Um, but he had gone to World War II, or World War I prior to our entry and observed what was going on, particularly with British um, medicine, and came back with this idea, and he recommended that these units, these base hospitals, will be most efficient if they're exclusively made up of men who've had similar training and who know each other well, and if, they've been, if they have associated with them a nursing staff familiar with their methods. So the idea was you'd pull together a base hospital of people who knew each other from one place, and they would be ready to deploy to Europe when called upon. 
By April 1917, 33 hospitals were ready for deployment. Six sailed that month for Europe, and they were actually, this is one of those little known facts, those were actually the first Americans, um, Amer American army units um, in uh, France to fly the US flag. There were Americans there prior, but not necessarily in this capacity. And the first units that went over actually served with the British Expeditionary Forces hospitals, because we didn't have anything set up yet when they arrived. Now, the idea behind this organization, once we got to Europe, was supposed to look something like this. I don't know how well you can see it. Up at the top here is, this is where the enemy line is, um, no man's land. This is thinking about the, uh, eastern, the western front, not the eastern front. So this is no man's land. Back behind this, then, you've got the units that are serving there. Back behind that, you then have the, the stretcher bearers, which were famous in World War I. These were these poor guys who would, when things would clear, would hop up into no man's land with their stretchers and find people and then pull them back out, hoping not to get killed themselves, although that happened quite a bit, too. This was a, being a stretcher bearer was a high mortality uh, field to be in. You were brought back to these first aid and then dressing stations here. If you needed more care than that, you were evacuated to what were called field hospitals. If you needed more care than that, you were brought back to what were called um, evacuation hospitals. And then eventually, if need be, you were brought by railroad trains down to these big base hospitals that were way behind the enemy lines. Now, it looks very organized on paper. From what I read and what you can suspect, I don't think it was nearly that organized always in practice. But that was the idea. You could go progressively to more and more care as you needed it. In the early thinking of this, nurses would be back here predominantly at the base hospitals. They would not go up farther, closer to the front. Again, you would not want women towards the front um, in the battle. That turned out not to be good thinking. It made more sense to bring nurses particularly up to these field hospitals because the, we found it was much better to do surgery right away. If you had somebody who had been out in no man's land with a horrific injury and then had to go through all these layers, and there are reports that it took 24 to 48 hours on a hospital train to get to a base hospital, that wound was horribly contaminated um, by the time they got to the base hospital. So pretty quickly they learned, and both the British did too, that we're much better off to have nurses up towards the front who could facilitate surgery and quick treatment of patients long before you brought them back to the base hospitals. And it gets confusing because we've got these base hospitals going over from the United States and their base hospitals, they're not quite the same. Um, we'll talk about that in a bit. So that's how it was organized. Now let's talk about nurses going over um, to Europe in the war. This is actually a picture of the Army Base Hospital, 50 nurses being transported to the base hospital where they were going to be working at in France. Not particularly the nicest of transportation, and you hear, you hear a lot about that in women's diaries from the war. Um, they ended up in rather uncomfortable um, tr trips across the country. So nursing in World War I, um, the Army Nurse Corps was established after the Spanish-American War in about 1901. And this is where we were really realizing after the Civil War and the Spanish-American War that we had not done soldiers well. So by then they put in the Army Nurse Corps. I should note that there was an Army, or there was a Navy Nurse Corps. They were very small. They played a somewhat of a role in World War I, but I have focused predominantly on the Army Nurse Corps. In March 1917, there were 430 ANC nurses on active duty. That's not very much as we were entering the war. They had about 8,000 nurses on reserve um, through the Red Cross. There's an interesting relationship between the Red Cross and the military. The Red Cross did a lot of the recruiting and working with these folks until they deployed, and then they became official Army units. They originally thought that they would need about 10,000 nurses for World War I, but very quickly that went up to 20 to 40,000 nurses. Now, there's a couple key points about this. Um, although these were Army Nurse Corps nurses, they did not have military rank. They were this weird thing. They were not civilians, but they weren't truly military. They did not have military rank at all. So they live in sort of a weird hybrid world. There were no untrained nurses or these volunteer nurses as part of the ANC. The British forces used on volunteer nurses extensively. The United States did not. By November 11th, there were about um, 21,000 nurses now in the Army Nurse Corps. About half of those ended up overseas, most of those in France, a few in Italy, a few in Britain. Um, a good chunk then also were serving in the United States, especially Puerto Rico. There were some on transport ships, but about half of these nurses ended up in Europe during the war. <clears throat> 
The U.S. nurses, I should tell you that there were U.S. nurses involved in the war from the beginning. There were Red Cross units that went over long prior to the United States entering the war, and those often had nurses with them. So you'll read one of the things that um, is a very prominent diary or book from World War I is a, written by a woman named Mary Borden, who was an American citizen who served early on in the war as, an, as a volunteer nurse from the United States in uh, Belgium. So nurses were very much involved prior to this, but this was the formal um, through the Army, the Army Nurse Corps beginning to be involved in the war. So the reality of nurses serving in the, in the military is very different than those myths that I showed you. And it, it involves both the sort of the gender piece of it. Again, they were women, so they weren't really fully part of the women. This is the first that women are deployed as part of the Army, but they're also not, they're not given real status within the Army, even though they're deployed with them. So it's this weird reality both of where nursing was and where women were in this particular country. And the reality is there was loss of life. We'll look at this um, real quickly in a couple minutes. The kind of care they were providing, I'll walk you through some examples of what that looked like. This was hard, hard care to provide. And then being at war, their living conditions were not good um, at all. But there were also great things about being in the war as well. Nurses expanded what they could do phenomenally. This is very common in war and very true in World War I. For many, this was the high point of their career. We'll look at some quotes by nurses about that. And then there's this whole piece of it that there was a sense of adventure about doing this. As women, they could not have been able to do the stuff that they did. But as a nurse, they could use this sort of as an umbrella in order to do stuff that was phenomenal. So it's this weird sort of thing of being in a gender sort of um, appropriate profession as a nurse, but then using that to go out and have a great deal of adventure and fun as well. So we'll look at each of these real quickly. So loss of life, this was really a dangerous war to be in, no doubt. No, S no U.S. nurses actually died because of enemy action, but about 268 nurses did die during the war. Now, most of those, no surprise, were from influenza. Um, that killed many, many people, but including nurses. But there were clearly accidents. That's not uncommon. One nurse committed suicide during World War I from the United States, and two nurses were, again, sort of a fun fact here, two nurses were the first American casualties after the U.S. entered the war. Yeah, um, that's sort of surprising. Uh, there was an explosion, a misfire of guns in a troop ship, and two nurses were killed. Um, I think they hadn't even left the port, as I remember correctly from the story. And this, this is a quote from a nurse who served with a hospital um, in Europe. She says, it was midnight when the first shell came over. All through the night, ambulances brought in the wounded. Operations were performed with shells shrieking overhead. So it was a very dangerous war for these nurses to be involved in. Now, nursing care, as I said, was really, this was complex physically and emotionally draining nursing care. Um, a woman who, as I quoted earlier, Christine Hallett is a scholar of World War I and nursing, and she wrote a really interesting book. She says that what nurses did in World War I and the care that they provided was contained trauma, and I think she means trauma very broadly. And she identified several different areas that nurses focused on during the war, controlling shock and containing life in the aftermath of injury, holding body and soul together, thinking about hemorrhage, uh, which was huge, protecting and healing the physical wound. They spent a lot of time on wounds. It's a big part of the patient care that they provided. Again, this is a time of influenza, typhoid, other kinds of stuff. So they spent a lot of time handling pus and gore, which for non-nurses sounds horrible, but that's kind of a core to what we do. Um, the toxic gases that were used in the war, this was very traumatic for nurses to take care of these very Ill, Ill, Ill soldiers when they came in after being gassed. And then finally, far too much of the time, they had to deal with death of those young men as well. This is a picture from my grandmother's photo album, and it's a, a fracture ward, and look at all the stuff in here. You can imagine how complex care is trying to move around all these things that are trying to keep people's fractures in line and stuff where they're, they're uh, putting stuff, dripping stuff into these wounds to cleanse them. Again, a long quote, but another really good one, because I think it highlights the complexity of nursing care. Nursing work overlapped significantly with that of the physician or surgeon. Indeed, much of it was concerned with reporting observations on the patient's condition and on carrying on the doctor's orders. But nurses' work went much further than this. A nurse who made a seriously ill and perhaps physically helpless, um, I lost my place there, patient comfortable in a clean bed, dressed his wounds, 
eased his pain and distress, assisted him with washing, and ensured that he had adequate intake of food and fluids, was practicing outside and well beyond the domain of medicine, performing skills tasks essentially to the maintenance or restoration of health. There was artistry to this practice that exceeded the competence of most doctors because their apparently basic and simple actions were, in fact, extraordinary in their complexity. They not only kept the patient in good physical health, they also enabled him to experience the nebulous and immeasurable concept of comfort, which in turn kept him emotionally and psychologically well, further enhancing physical health. In the first two decades of the 20th century, doctors were trained to view the body as a mechanical structure, subject to certain known, known named diseases. Their close colleagues, nurses, were learning that the human being was more than just a mechanism. It was, rather, a network of organic structures fused with energy in a state of constant change, always close to that unattainable equilibrium of health. And again, it's a long quote, but I think it really highlights what nursing provided. We put a lot of focus on what the surgeons did. But there was this complex part of nursing care that was critical to helping these patients live um, after, during the war. So I'm going to give you two examples from Christine Hallett's book. Uh, she talks about how nurses spend a lot of time controlling shock and containing life. For the nurses in the room, some of this will look very familiar. We're used to replacing fluids. We still do that today, and these nurses were doing that then. Um, we were already giving blood transfusions by World War I, so those were given. Lots of warming. I don't know that we do that so much anymore, but there was a lot of emphasis on warming up the patient with hot drinks and hot blankets. They put a lot into that. They actually used some drugs. Atropine is the one that's still familiar to us this day um, in this kind of a situation. They would use oxygen, lots of vigilant assessment of that patient, really watching for those close signs that the patient might be struggling in some way, and reassurance. Now, this is a quote from a nurse that really highlights that, again, containing shock in patients. And I want you to see a couple things. Think about the number that she's talking about here. We received 65 cases that first night. So she's in a unit, and they're receiving 65 wounded soldiers at one time and performed 30 operations. Every case was at death's door. There lay British, German, French, Belgians, their greenish-gray faces looking ghastly in the dim light. Remember, we had only nine nurses for the night and day work. There were only two of us on the ground floor, where there were two little wards in the theater. We called some of the day nurses to help. If these men were to be saved, it was only by immediate restoratives. We flew from man to man, inserting hypodermic needles, giving in saline injections by the dozens. And just put that into your mind. Again, those of you who are nurses can probably somewhat imagine this, but I can't truly imagine what this was like to provide this kind of care with this volume of patients critically injured coming in from the battlefield. Another one, as I said to you before, nurses spent a lot of time dealing with wounds. Uh, the war, when you think about it, with the machine guns and the weaponry we had, these were wounds that people had never thought of before and never dealt with, the physicians or the nurses, either one. So tons of times of cleaning wounds in the surrounding area. They irrigated a lot with various kinds of solutions. This is pre-antibiotics, so there, we know about um, that we need to be able to, we've got germ theory, but we, and we know we need to have a sepsis, but we have no antibiotics. So they flushed these very big wounds continually with various types of solutions. So you can imagine when you've got that and you're flushing what that is like to deal with the dressings. Lots of splints. Nurses were removing shrapnel. They managed these fractures with all these complex um, casts and traction. And of course, true to Florence Nightingale, they thought fresh air and sunlight would be beneficial as well, and I suspect it was. So this is a quote from Julia Stimson, who is a very prominent nurse in World War I from the United States. She says, our surgical unit looks like a carpenter shop. We have tent beds under a wooden canopy frame to which poor shattered legs of our blown to pieces men are fastened. When a leg is broken in half a dozen places and there are several gaping infected wounds besides, it's something of a trick of carpentry and mechanics to make the poor fellows comfortable, put on extension so the legs won't contract and yet make it possible to irrigate the wounds. Rubber tubes run in and out of his thigh and knee, and his wounds are irrigated through these tubes, which are perforated. Again, imagine trying to do that. Um, and of course, she had to wear the proper clothing. We, did, we would, didn't go into that, but she, as a nurse, she would have had to wear these quite gangly uniforms that would have made this even more difficult. So that's an example of the nursing care that, that nurses provided in nursing in World War I. The other sort of downside of being in the war, if you want to think about it that way, is just being at war. These women had to maintain societally acceptable behavior. 
under very difficult terms. So again, think about what we talked about women at that time. Now you're in Europe. They're using privies. They live in tents that leak. Um, it was difficult to do what that sort of behavior that was expected of women at this time. They had no military rank, as I said to you before. There are cases of harassment um, that have been documented of nurses in World War I. The travel and transportation during that time was difficult. Um, and then they really had poor living conditions on top of it. This is probably my most favorite picture from my grandmother's photo album. This is my grandmother. This is a sergeant. And the, the, you can't read it. It's very light. But it says, um, myself, sergeant, and mud. And this is, it's a little hard to see, but this is all big piles of mud here. Um, so, but there were good, there were exciting parts of being involved in, as a nurse in World War I. And this, this quote really highlights it. Uh, this is from a woman who actually went on, those of you who know this, um, she went on to write the um, Sue Barton nursing series. She was a trained nurse, had gone to Johns Hopkins, which at that time was one of the top nursing schools. But after the war, she got inspired and became a writer and wrote what was a delightful series about nursing called Sue Barton. Um, and she writes about a case. She said he, uh, dad, came all the way from Australia to fight for the England he had never seen. He's over 60, and no one can imagine how he got into the army, but he did. And now he lies here with his leg torn to pieces. One day when I was there before, he complained of pain in his thigh and began to run quite a temperature, a temp. As his leg was laid wide open anyhow, I took a look along the bone. Dad, meantime, cussing the roof off. I found a walled-in pus pocket, and picking up a scalpel, told Dad he'd better look out the window for a minute, as I was going to have to hurt him. Then, before he knew what I was about, I had slit the thing open. At least two cupfuls of pus poured out, and his, and his relief was tremendous, of course. And, of course, his temperature dropped as well. Now think about this. This is a nurse independently in an open wound saying, sure, I can drain your pus pocket. This is, this is how nurses were able to expand their practice during war. There were no physicians, or there were physicians, but they were probably not available. She knew what to do. She just took the thing, sliced the pus pocket open. The guy felt much, much better. So this incredible expansion of practice is very common in wars, and it was particularly common in World War I. Nurses jumped at the chance to be able to. They knew what they were doing. But in the United States, they'd not been able, allowed to do that. It was also the high point of the career for many nurses. This is, again, Julia Stimson, who I spoke of before. She was head of Red Cross in Europe during World War I and eventually became, I don't remember the, the title, superintendent of the Army Nurse Corps um, as well. And she wrote about this to her, in a letter to her parents in 1917. She said, aside from what we think about the causes and principles involved and the tremendous satisfaction of having a chance to help work them out, to be in the front ranks in this most dramatic event that ever was staged, and to be in the first group of women ever called out for duty with the United States Army, and the first part of the Army ever sent off on an expeditionary affair of this sort, it is all too much good fortune for any person like me. And I don't think that was uncommon, this sense of, wow, this is, for me, going to be the highlight um, of my career. I don't know in my grandmother's case, although I've always been fascinated, she kept m many, many things from World War I. So I wouldn't be surprised, maybe in a different way, if she felt that same way, that this was one of the high points of her career as well. And then finally, these nurses had a great deal of adventure as well. This is a picture, again, from my grandmother's uh, photo album. It's a little bit hard to see. This is this big chateau in France. And there are three of them walking up to go visit it. They went out all the time looking at the area around, having all kinds of adventures. And this is a quote from another US nurse. She says, in spite of the many ups and downs of army life overseas, with the privations, discomforts, and hardship, and the unpleasant happenings which seem to come to all of us at one time or another, I look back on my two years of army service, 22 months of which was spent overseas, as a great and wonderful experience. To quote Colonel Roosevelt, it was indeed the great adventure. I shall ever feel that it was a very great privilege to have served in France with the American Air Force, I mean the Army, the American Expeditionary Forces during the momentous and stirring days of World War. And again, that sense of adventure going over there is really prominent in a lot of the nursing writing from this time period. Now, I put this one in for the nurses in the audience because I just simply love this. There's a lot of, part of this in, in adventure is just coming up with solutions to the problems that they faced in Europe. This is from a nurse, a uh, U.S. nurse, and she says, when a sheet is soiled at the top from coming in contact with the patient's food, it may be reversed. Now, Holly Miller's in the room, so don't fake, Holly, when you hear about this quote. 
to provide a clean space at the head of the bed and prevent the soiled part, still turned uppermost at the foot, from coming in contact with the patient's feet. This device is necessary not always because of the shortage of lemon, linen, but because of the great laundry problem. I added that in there because I just love that. In many places in France, laundry is done on the stones adjoining a creek. Hot water seemed almost impossible to procure on account of the lack of fuel. Our linen had to be transported 40 miles by two army trucks. So nurses had to be incredibly creative in coming up with solutions to the problems they encountered as nurses. And this is just a delightful example of that. So what happened after the war? Um, this is a picture of my great aunt, Ollie, right here, standing in front of what's a cabin on a homestead that she uh, took up in, in the, about 1920 in Oregon. I don't know much more about it, but she actually homesteaded and actually proved up on this property. Did she get inspired by the war? Um, all the talk of women and women's rights and came back and homesteaded? I, have, I don't really know and probably will never know. But women came back with differing responses to World War I. And I think this quote from another uh, US Army nurse uh, really, feel, really helps you understand that. She says, the state of mind of some resembles somewhat the forlorn desolation of a homeless cat. It applies especially to the returned overseas nurse, but at any rate, they were home. As the days passed, the longing for a wider sphere became more acute. The present somehow does not seem to fit with the past. The people at home have advanced along different lines from those who went overseas, and they cannot see why the daily round cannot easily be taken up again. And then how one misses the com comradeship of the life over there, where the comradeship, which by force of contrast makes the bustling life at home, where each one is intent on his or own business, seem cold and unfriendly. And not an uncommon response to military service, I think. And you, you hear that in the nurses as well. So what happened after one, World War I more collectively? Well, of course, we know the women got the right to vote in 1920. Nursing, it was a longer haul, I think, um, of really trying to become recognized. That's what they were, they were working towards. In relation to nursing and nursing education, um, schools of nursing remained for a long time under-resourced. Um, it was a, quite a battle to remove this so that patients weren't just provided care by nursing students. There was a very influential pro, uh, a report that came out called the Flexner Report of Medicine. Nursing a couple years later had their version of it, the Goldmark Report. It did not have the impact that the Flexner Report had on nursing. So nursing education struggled for a long time. Continued workforce challenges. There was this huge growth in hospitals that was happening at that time. But the care was still provided by student nurses. You saw this really interesting phenomenon of underemployment then of graduate nurses. If you could get into private duty, that was great. But private duty markets were shrinking because now people were saying you go to the hospital when you're sick, you don't stay home. Public health, but public health didn't um, particularly hire that many people. So you see this really interesting oversupply of nurses. When the Great Depression hit, nurses were hit very hard. Graduate nurses were hit very hard because they weren't employed in hospitals and there wasn't much private duty and what was left couldn't be afforded by people during the depression anyway but most states were now requiring a registration the army nurse corps right after immediately after the war um, you saw this whole focus on, on demobilization and reorganization which was um, significant most nurses did not stay in the military after World War I. So imagine the uh, demobilization. By July of 1920, the ANC, which had been at its peak about 20,000, was back down to about 1,500 nurses again. So huge demobilization of nurses. But there were a lot of issues. Um, nurses still didn't get the same pay. It was until World War II before they actually got um, what was called relative rank. They got relative rank shortly after World War I, but they didn't get true rank until World War II as nurses in the military. Um, they did get retirement benefits in 1926. They were this weird thing of being Army, but not completely Army, but not civilian, either one. Um, so some gains made, but slower over time. And I think, quite frankly, um, nursing still is sort of struggling for that piece of recognition. It's much, much better than it was. But if you think about it, there's still what, what started in a lot of ways as very much a gender-biased view of nursing and women um, created a hierarchy in healthcare that's still here today to some extent, changing but still here today. Um, I was giggling the other day thinking about every couple years somebody brings forth a resolution to the American Medical Association that would ban nurses from using the title doctor even if they have a doctoral degree. 
which is one of those stu silly, sort of silly um, sort of hierarchical arguments that still occurs. It's no longer gender-based, but it's the idea that nurses have to be supervised by medicine. So nursing has had a slower crawl, I think, um, after the war. Um, and I think that's my last slide. And I don't know where we're, if we want questions now or if we want to do questions now. Questions or comments? I'm curious your thoughts and um, questions after the presentation. American mission, which was building a hospital, so it was medical work. And the comment there from the doctor and the nurses, that again, the nurses could do a lot more over there than they could that. And the doctors were glad because the doctors didn't have to do all this work. The nurses could take it over. The nurses were glad because they could take over this work they couldn't do back, Absolutely. back home. It was like that. Yep. Mm -hmm. the physical aspects of it, but one thing I was curious about were the mental aspects. You read about the shell shock treatment yes. and how they were treated by the officers, by the people back home, by the doctors themselves. And I'm just wondering how the nurses responded to that. It's a good question, and, and interesting enough, there's some research on that, but not a lot that looks specifically at nurses. And I would suspect that it runs across the gamut. Um, I, I think given nurses focus on caring in general, they would have approached it a bit different than others. But I would suspect you're going to find nurses that were just on either end of this, either you know more, um, this is their fault, they just need to buck up, what's wrong with them, they should just get back there on the battlefield. But there's not a lot on that. Folks with shell shock were treated very interesting during the war, across the gamut, again, from lots of sort of moral aspects of that, that they just, this, they, they should just get over this, they're scared, they don't want to go back to the war, they're not being patriotic, they're trying to escape. It was a challenging piece, but I'm not familiar with a lot of research specifically focused on nurses. Good question. Yeah. It's a good question. I don't know if I could tell you how frequently, although there was a real push to do that. There was also a push to have specialized units that could go up close to the front. So a unit that would have specialty, say, in abdominal trauma, for example, that could be pushed up towards the front to do really quick surgery before these patients were transported way back. How common that was, I don't know if I could answer specifically that piece of it. There certainly were lots of efforts to develop sort of these shock teams was another one. Um, nurses that were expertise in terms of gassed patients. So there was lots of that going, but I don't know that I could tell you the amount. Yeah. Were there any antibiotics that were developed as a result of the hormone? No, because penicillin came out, help me my nursing call, 1937, 43. Yeah, I was thinking late 30s, early 40s. So no, there were no antibiotics at all. The other interesting piece of World War I with the pandemic flu, they did not know what caused pandemic flu. There were lots of theories, um, but they did, not, they did not have the ability to see viruses at that point. So while they had been able to identify various bacteria by World War I, they could not see uh, viruses. So even during World War I, they did not know what caused influenza. not be part of the enormous expansion of veterans' hospitals in the 20s as a result of the war. I think you said there were student nurses. The hospitals, as I said, this is sort of the weird history of, of nursing. Um, as those hospitals began to develop in the late 1880s um, and then really exploding in the early 1900s and then well past World War I, um, they were all staffed by nurses. nurses. Nursing students were cheap labor. They didn't have to pay them very much. There was a continual supply of these student nurses coming in off farms and ranches from the city. This was an opportunity for them. They got paid a little bit. It wasn't much, but they got paid. So there was this huge supply of student nurses. So hospitals were staffed by student nurses. And graduates, graduate nurses got out and either did private duty 
um, which again was difficult over time because with the growth of hospitals, fewer and fewer people were getting care in their home. Um, so these graduate nurses got out and didn't have much to do, which I've often thought was partly why they may have gotten 20,000 nurses to sign up for the ANC because it was a source of employment for them. But my question has to do with at the end of World War I. It's a great question. It doesn't make any sense to us at all in retrospect. No, it, it doesn't make any sense. Why would you have this pool of graduate nurses who now, those coming back from Europe, would have had great experience Note, we still continued to staff hospitals well into the 30s and 40s. There were hospitals that were very progressive, Johns Hopkins being one of them, saying, no, this doesn't make sense. We're going to staff by, by graduate nurses. But most hospitals well after World War I still staffed with student nurses. Um, Is there one other question? Is there any data that you have about uh, how, how many or what percentage of the nurses in Europe would wind up marrying the soldiers that they were taking care of? Interesting question. I don't know. I've not seen anything like that. Presumably some certainly did. Um, but I don't have any numbers, and I haven't seen any reports of that either. Jeannie. Yes. Um, which is clear back in World mm -hmm. War One, but it, that sort of tells me why we started wearing white. Because I've always thought that nurses dressed in white is such a a way to get messy. They you, why white? You know why white? Well, duh, they were spilling Clorox on themselves. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a good <laughs> it's a good theory, and it may be accurate. I don't know. Yeah, the, it, that part of it is interesting. The whole wound care stuff is fascinating. Again, we did not have antibiotics. And I'm thinking mostly of the Western Front. The Eastern Front's quite a bit different and totally fascinating. There's a whole other topic of conversation of care on the Eastern Front. But on the Western Front, if you think about it, the typical injury was in no man's land. Um, the person got shot, lays there for a period of time up to, I read reports of soldiers that laid there for five, seven, eight days before someone was able to rescue them. Their wounds, this, this is farmland in, in um, Belgium and in France. Um, filled with hundreds and thousands of years of manure and the various stuff that goes with it. So these wounds were grossly, grossly contaminated by the time they would get back to a place for treatment. There are no antibiotics at all. But the thing they were finding was that if they continued to flush these wounds, they could, and in some cases, and they kept them open, there was the whole gas gangrene that's talked about in World War I. Those are anaerobic bacteria meaning they do well when there's no oxygen. So if they opened these wounds up and kept them open and flushed them continually, in some cases they actually saw good results. Now some of them, they had to do lots of amputations, um, but some of them they were actually able to heal people. And, and you've probably seen the really rather dramatic pictures of World War I soldiers who did heal and have amazing injuries, yes, as a result. This is the start of modern rehabilitation as well. Um, because they realized, again, there were, there were injuries that they had not fathomed in the past, and then, then they were able to save some of these soldiers. So soldiers were coming home with unbelievable um, amp number of ampu multiple amputations, um, significant facial and head wounds, and really needed significant rehabilitation after they got home. So this is also the rise of modern rehabilitation services as well. Any other thoughts or comments? We have some special things happening after this, so I don't want to take too much time. Yeah. I'm sorry, but you talked about how the American nurses had a close relationship with the Red Cross. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more about that and whether or not we saw American Army nurses in places like Turkey or overseas doing other Red Cross operations. Absolutely. So there, there's this interesting relationship with the Army and the Red Cross during this time period. The Red Cross almost played a quasi-governmental role. So they recruited nurses, health professionals, and others, and had them. So my grandmother and her sister would have been Red Cross nurses until they left to go to Europe, and then they became, and they were deployed. They became Army nurses. But before that, they were Red Cross nurses. Red Cross did a lot of fundraising. They helped get um, ambulances to take over. And prior to the United States entering the war, Red Cross units went over to Europe and with both parties, actually, they did this for the Central Powers and for the Allied Forces. They were, we were neutral, 
And so Red Cross units went over and provided health care in all of those countries. So yes, there were, would have been US nurses virtually everywhere um, in, the, in World War I. Not as much prior to the beginning when the United States entered the war, but um, absolutely. Yes, so you would have seen nurses from the United States potentially serving in, um, I don't know if they were in Gallipoli or not, but in, those, in the Eastern Front as well. Um, like I said, the Eastern Front had some fascinating stuff. So they were, there were these things called, um, oh, I hope I get the name right, flying tunnels. Um, they were the Russian equivalent of mobile, unit, of mobile mash units. And these flying tunnels would kind of swoop in wherever the latest battle was on the Eastern Front with nurses and doctors. And then as soon as that was over, they'd swoop off and go somewhere else. Now, flying tunnel just create, or flying, what did I say it wasn't tunnel? Flying, it wasn't, did I say tunnel? I don't think it was tunnel, something else, flying something. Anyway, this notion of these units flying in is just wonderful for me to think about. I don't, they didn't actually fly in, but it makes it sound really dramatic. So the Eastern Front has a lot of interesting and fascinating differences in relation to the war, but also in relation to military medicine and nursing. It's a quite different aspect. Um, there were very few American nurses on that front, but the, the diaries of Australian, British, New Zealand nurses who served um, in Egypt and places like that are un rather unbelievable, to be quite truthful with you. Poor facilities and really, really poor, horrible heat, dry winds. They would be taking care of patients in these big tents, and the wind would be blowing sand in continually with bugs in all of their wounds. Pretty dramatic on the Eastern Front. And of course, in the winter, then these horribly, horribly, horribly cold, cold places. So that's a sort of a different experience on the Eastern Front. Thank you. For, oh, two Probably, I don't really know if there's been a comparison, but if you think about, again, troops coming off of, they would come off of these sites like Gallipoli. They'd be um, pulled down with stretcher bears, were put on these troop ships that were poorly equipped. They'd have hundreds and hundreds of men lying in these ships. And then they'd take these somewhere across the Mediterranean to some sort of a hospital, which was a poorly equipped hospital to begin with. Um, the stories that I have read from nursing diaries from that part would suggest that it was, if you survived, you were pretty darn tough if you came out of those places with severe injuries. Um, but I don't know of a comparison, but it wouldn't surprise me. Um, yeah. If you want, and it kind of depends on what you want to have out of it, if you really want a good overview of what nurses did during World War I, Containing Trauma by Christine Hallett is an excellent book. Now, if you're not a nurse, it might not be one that grabs you that much. But if you just want to know the day-to-day -day of what nurses were doing, if you want to know no more about some of the writing, there are incredible diaries that came out of World War I. There is some awesome writing that came out of it. Uh, Vera Britton's book, she was British, but her book, um, which is a reflection on her time in World War I, is a phenomenal piece of work. Mary Borden, who wrote a book called The Forbidden Zone, is a phenomenal piece of essays um, written about World War I. Um, so it kind of depends on what angle you want to take. Um, if you want to talk to me privately, I can sort of guide you to several really good books. Um, also, Mary, just at the American Heritage Center, we have a, a scrapbook of a World War I nurse, American nurse who served in France. It's a wonderful scrapbook. Her name is Muriel Valentine. But at the American Heritage Center, if you want to view a scrapbook yeah. of one of the nurses. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time and interest.